Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 27th meeting of 2018. With no apologies, but Liam MacArthur has indicated his flight's been delayed, so he'll be a little later in joining us. Our first agenda item is to decide whether to take items five and six in private. This is consideration of the committee's letter on its recent pre-budget scrutiny and to consider potential witnesses for its scrutiny of the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. Are we all agreed? We are, thank you. Agenda item two is an evidence session on post-legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. I refer members to paper one, which is a note from the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. We'll hear from two panels this morning, and I welcome our first panel, Chief Constable Ian Livingston from Police Scotland and on behalf of the committee I'd like to congratulate him on his recent appointment and Susan Deacon, Chair of the Scottish Police Authority whom I welcome back to committee. I thank the witnesses for the written evidence which is always so helpful to the committee. We now move straight to questions from members as both witnesses have indicated that they don't wish to make an opening statement. Starting with Fulton. Thank you, Convener, and good morning, uh, panel. The, we've heard quite a lot that the, the reasons behind the, the change to Police Scotland was mainly financial. Do, as an opening question, do you think that the, the reasons to move to a single force were sound? Who would like to take that one? Take that chair yeah, if I can. Yeah, no, thank you for that. The, um, I think the financial um, operating environment was, was undoubtedly a factor, and it was explicitly so in, in the discussion and debate to move from the nine legacy operating arrangements, arrangements to one. Um, but in my view, I, do, I think there's also a number of other factors about current threats that we face, but just as importantly, future threats. So the ability of policing in Scotland to make sure that um, the increasing threat from cybercrime, that people are being defrauded online, people are being exploited online, um, the threat from serious and organised crime in all our communities, not, not simply in the central belt, right across the whole of Scotland, um, the increased vulnerability, uh, and the need for, for policing to respond to, to, to individuals who are vulnerable, I think, meant that our, our structures um, were, not, uh, were, not, were not optimum. I also think one of the difficulties um, or challenges that we've had in articulating the value of the single service is it, it is undoubtedly true to say that we, did not, we didn't reform from a position of, of crisis. If you look internationally at significant pieces of police reform, it's often the case that it arises after a, a, a real crisis in, in, in confidence. So the, the, the Belgian paedophile uh, scandal or, or, or other such instances. So, the, so policing in Scotland was, was working and, 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 and was, was effective, but it was working and it was effective despite the structures. It was working and effective despite the disparity in capability and capacity that existed uh, right across the country. So I, I do think that finance was one reason for, for the change if we wanted to maintain the service that we've got. But I also think that making sure policing was fit for purpose now and in the future was another strong reason uh, to make the change. And, and, and I, I think that the, the, the five years we've had show that is, that is the case. So, so taking you on from there a wee bit, do, um, what do you think some of the implications would have been for operational policing had the reform not been made? I think it would have been difficult uh, under the, the, the financial arrangements to ma maintain the structure. I think year on year we've taken about £200 million from uh, the annual budget uh, in, in, in real costs. Now, that's, that's in excess of the revenue cost of two or three of the, of the legacy forces. So if we'd stayed existing as we did, which, which, as I said, had, had, was effective as far as it went, um, but there was enormous inefficiencies and there was enormous gaps in, in our effectiveness. So I don't think, in my view, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's my own perspective, undoubtedly, um, I don't think Scotland would be as safe now and in the future as it is had we not gone through that process of reform. That, that's the short answer. Um, if I could uh, comment on, on that too, I mean, I think the Parliament did absolutely the right thing 
and at the right time in terms of reforming the police service. Um, and I'm very struck the more time that I've, I've spent in this role and the more that I've worked um, on and, and with people across in policing across the UK and more widely, um, how much um, stronger it has actually made us um, in terms of delivering a police service that's fit for the future. I mean, I'm conscious that myself and Mr Finney and uh, one of the committee clerks attended, for example, a conference yesterday that Cyper um, and Scott Sen and What Works Scotland organised that heard from speakers from a number of other countries that have gone through similar reforms or are identifying the need to go through similar reforms. In some cases, I think the Netherlands, more than 20 forces have been brought together into one national force. They've encountered many similar challenges of change to those that Scotland has encountered in, in actually taking that forward. But without question, you know, there's a, there is a clear need um, to go in that direction. And I think even if you just look south of the border, and some of the challenges that are, are now playing out very openly in select committee inquiries in Westminster and so on around, you know, the, the challenges of having 43 regional forces and how you actually manage that to provide a police service, you know, that can actually meet the, the kind of challenges that exist in the world today. Um, you know, the, these, these are real issues. I think, you know, I've certainly been very clear about what I think are, are the really quite significant deficiencies in terms of the early work done or not done to build a police authority that works effectively. And that's something that, that I've worked very hard on over the last 10 months to turn around. But I think the legislative framework is right. And I think the, the reforms were it, absolutely the right direction of travel to go down. And I think this, the country's better for it. Okay. Are, are you able to elaborate any examples, elaborate on any examples, sorry, where, um, where, where you think policing has been um, better as a result of the reform. Right. I think the, um, the, the investigation of death go, goes, goes to the heart of the legitimacy of policing when, 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 when somebody dies under cer certain circumstances, often unexplained. Now, when it's clear that it, it's, it's a criminal death, I think the, 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 the legitimacy of policing is, is vital that that is then responded to fully, thoroughly, and, and not only the, the the, um, the family, but the wider, wider community are reassured that, that that will be investigated thoroughly. We've had over 320 murders committed since Police Scotland came into being, um, and with the exception of, of two current ongoing inquiries involving seasonal organised crime, every single one of those uh, murder investigations have been detected. Now, when I share that with colleagues internationally, they, they're really quite uh, struck by the significance of it. And that's because we've now got a capability that wherever a death occurs in Scotland, we will respond to that thoroughly. And the second point I would make in regard to that specific example that, that you asked for, is not just in terms of murder investigations, it's actually into unexplained deaths and then the need to respond properly in the first few hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, um, to actually, if need be, eliminate criminality. So we've now got the capability that we'll go and we'll make sure that, it, that things are done properly, f forensically, that there's rigour, there's thoroughness done, so that families are not left asking questions for, for years and decades, decades to come. And if it is accidental and if it is a suicide, we're in a far better position to link in to family. So one key area, I would say, and it's not just investigation of murder, it's actually the investigation and response to, to unexplained deaths. I think there's, it's, a, a, it's night and day from, from where we were previously. And I wonder if I could just, just um, add to that. When we talk about the benefits that have accrued from having a national force, we quite rightly, I think, often focus on, for example, murder and major investigations and that sharing a specialist capability across the country. And of course, areas like cybercrime and counter-terrorism that require that um, real strength that you can get from having a national force. But I think that sometimes we forget how much it matters to people in local communities that, that they get the, the same high standard of policing right across the country. And I've read with great interest all the submissions to the committee and two that, that really registered with me were from Scottish Women's Aid and Rape Crisis Scotland, um, who have pointed to um, the real benefits now of there being the same high standards across the country in the areas that they're dealing with. And I think that's absolutely right. You know, a woman that's experienced 
domestic violence in Inverness should be able to expect you know, exactly the same high standard of, of support from the police service as in Gala Shields or, or anywhere else in the country. So I think it's important not to lose sight of those benefits too. One more question, Kavina, if that's sure. all right. Yeah. Hey, thanks a lot. I started off my line of questioning by asking about the financial um, implications of reform, and I, I'm glad that the conversation went on more to the operational uh, issues. But just going back to the financial um, question um, quickly, obviously the budget yesterday has raised the head again of the 175 million VAT that uh, police uh, and fire services are owed, if you like, in Scotland. Are, are, are the police making any representation to the UK government um, on that issue to have that money reclaimed? I haven't done that directly myself. I've certainly made representations to the, the chair of the police authority and to civil servants at, at Scottish government, um, just saying that, that that would obviously be of assistance. Um, but I didn't, I didn't feel it was me to, for, uh, I didn't feel it was my position to speak directly to the UK government. So I've spoken to own, the chair of own authority in that regard. And if I could just add to that, as members are aware, one of the provisions of, of the, the statute is that the accountable officer function sits within the police authority. That's a role held by currently our interim chief officer and from next week our new chief executive that will be um, picking up that role. And I think one of the things that we've worked really hard to do within the SPA is to develop and strengthen um, that accountable officer function because that's where obviously the accountability sits for the £1.1 billion budget um, of policing in Scotland. And part of that is about ensuring that the account accountable officer is more active and assertive um, in the space that is about making representations, whether it's to Scottish Government or whether it's, you know, that, that um, slightly more complex landscape, which is also the, in, in connection with intergovernmental issues. So there's been quite a number of things recently that, at the Police Authority Board, for example, um, and I'm thinking of issues to do with potential additional policing costs of Brexit, especially in the event of a no deal. I'm thinking also about President Trump's visit and so on, where we have very actively um, sought further information from the Chief Constable about additional policing costs accruing from operations like that, for example, so that the accountable officer um, can be stronger in, in the work that he is taking forward in making those representations, including where necessary, either directly with the UK government, where that's appropriate, or more often than not, via Scottish government, in terms of their, their negotiations and representations on issues like the one that you've, you've mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Good. Jenny. Good morning to the panel. Um, Ian Livingston, you started by saying we didn't reform from a position of crisis, but I think both witnesses will recall the tension which previously existed between Police Scotland and the SPA during the early days of reform. Um, what steps have been taken in the interim period then to improve the situation in the last five years? Well, if I perhaps pick up on that first, um, I, I have thoughts and, and observations of the last five years. Um, I'm accountable for the last 10 going on 11 months. Um, and I would particularly uh, 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 direct um, Ms Gilruth and other members to the additional submission that I put in last week, um, which set out the range of measures that I've driven forward as chair to get the SPA into the kind of shape that it, it needs to be in to be an effective and trusted public body. And I hope that members have found that helpful. I'm obviously very happy to take questions on that. In addition, the other thing which I've driven as, as, as chair is I, a big job of work to strengthen leadership and governance in Police Scotland. Um, and frankly, you know, on, on both fronts, both in terms of the SPA board, the leadership of Police Scotland, and increasingly, although it's still a work in progress, building the capacity of the SPA as an organisation, I think we're in a fundamentally different place from when um, myself and Ian Livingston as then Deputy Chief Constable appeared before this committee back in January. We are still on a journey. I'm not for a moment saying that, that everything's exactly where it should be. But I do honestly think that a lot of those early issues that were played out very publicly, um, are, are, you know, around very public spats, frankly, you know, between the SPA and the Chief Constable, including in front of the, the then Justice Committee and others. Um, I think we've moved on dramatically from there. And what we're really working on now is 
um, ensuring that the governance and scrutiny arrangements that we have within the police authority are absolutely fit for purpose to serve our dual role of being able to both support and challenge Police Scotland. Um, so that's about holding the Chief Constable to account, but it's also about fulfilling our statutory obligation to maintain and improve policing. And in the latter, sometimes that's about working very closely with Police Scotland, for example, and taking forward the change programme. On other occasions, as I say, it's our job to hold the Chief Constable to account for the work that he's now doing leading the force. And the fact that we now have a new Chief Constable, two Deputy Chief Constables, and three new... Um, sorry, two new Deputy Chief Constables and three new Assistant Chief Constables, which accounts for a large part of my summer in terms of um, designing and executing these recruitment processes, um, means that we now have, I think, a really strong team at the top of Police Scotland, and we're, you know, aiming, we're building that in the SPA as well, and I think it's through that strength um, that we can get into the place that we need to be that's mutually respectful um, and works to the benefits of, of policing in Scotland. I hope that answers mm -hmm. your question. I'm conscious I, I didn't talk about the first four years in any great depth. You, in Livingston, would you like to add your thoughts? Or? Yeah, thank you. The, the, um, again, look, look, looking back, although I try to look forward more, more, more than looking back, but, but looking back, we were, as, as, a, as a police service and as an organisation, we were moving into a completely new uh, system of governance that, that nobody had had ex experienced of before. And that, that, that was the same for the members of the police authority, the officials supporting the police authority, officials within Scottish government and um, senior officers within the police service, of, of, of which I, I was one. So we were used to, to the, the local boards. Um, there was a familiarity um, and there was a level of trust and, and, and understanding. And, and undoubtedly, as we moved towards this new structure uh, under the primary legislation, that there wasn't a shared understanding, there wasn't a shared purpose, and, and all of that caused an, an enormous amount of tension. I think what I would say, sitting here now, is that from a police perspective, uh, we have undoubtedly recognised the, the value of, of scrutiny, the value of, of, of oversight, uh, and the absolute need for, for, for robust accountability. And the, and the reason for that is that I think that's, that's where we get our, our trust and, and our legitimacy from. And I'm also very confident that the more people learn about policing and the more engagement people have with policing, actually the more reassured they are about the motives and, 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 and the good faith and the public service that, that lies, lies behind that. So that, that includes engagement with members of this committee mm -hmm. uh, as much, you know, absolute... And as members around this table, I hope, I hope we, 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 we'd agree, you know, a, a, a willingness to acknowledge where shortcomings have been, but a, a, a willingness to also uh, to, to shine a light on, on, on issues and, and problems and then, and then collectively make sure we're in a better position. So I do think the relationships are entirely different. And from a police perspective, uh, I think we're much more open uh, to, to accountability and, and, and much more welcoming of that. Thank you. Um, Susan Deacon, a note from your uh, submission for today that the SPA would be concerned that uncertainty and disruption caused by opening up the Act at this time would be destabilising and could create a risk. Um, and I also appreciate you spoke um, to my previous question with regard to your role in terms of providing challenge and support. Some might view that as a, as a conflict of interest, perhaps. Um, I wonder, therefore, is the legislation still fit for purpose in terms of governance and accountability between the SPA and Police Scotland? Um, yes, th uh, thank you. I think these are really important um, um, questions to, uh, to address. If I could take the second point first, um, and it's that dual challenge and support function. It's often suggested that, that there's, a, the, there's a tension and a difficulty with having that dual function. Mm -hmm. I, I completely disagree with that. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's akin in many ways to the role of a government minister who has got to be you know, both the biggest ambassador and advocate for the public service or services that they're responsible for, and also be very challenging and hold those services to account. I think it's akin to many different forms of boards, public, private, third sector, where again, trustees or directors have to have that dual function of supporting the organisation while at the same time challenging um, their executives and, and so on. So I honestly don't see any conflict in that at all. I think what, what the SPA has, has lacked, um, and I think genuinely what we've now really started to flesh out, both in articulation but also in our governance frameworks and our practices, 
is frankly a bit of clarity and intellectual rigour around what those different functions are and how you perform them differently. Um, I, I think the, the SPU just was never built properly as an organisation. There just wasn't that clarity of, of purpose. And it's, it's been a huge job of work, and it would be very boring for me to talk through it all, but you know, I can assure you that this is something that, that we've addressed at a range of different levels to make sure that we're clear about performing both those roles. In terms of the legislation being fit for purpose, um, I think that it is crucial. Yes is a short answer. I think you could take any act of any parliament and you could always find areas, particularly you know, through post-legislative scrutiny, where you might you know, find areas to, to amend and change parts of it. But fundamentally, I think the structure's right. And I think it's critically important, not least given some of the challenges that both Police Scotland and the SPA have faced in the early years, that, that the organisations now get the chance to really stabilise and develop and deliver policing and a really formidable programme of change that needs to be taken forward. So that's why the SPA has been um, really very clear in, in our submission to say that while we absolutely welcome the post-legislative scrutiny process, I think that's a hugely important learning process, we, we would urge caution about making any further changes to, to the Act. And it's something that we hear from, from policing all the time on the ground. I'm sure the Chief, well, I know the Chief Constable hears this too, which is that you know, they want, the, the police service needs some clarity. Um, and we also, as an authority, you know, need that clarity and stability of a structure that we can then make work well. And that's really what we're focused on now. Thank you. Uh, Ian Livingston? I, I, I think the... Um, I think the acts never, or, or the, the intent and the governance that was built into the acts, is for, for various reasons, probably never properly operated for in, in, in different ways. We've never actually had that period of, of stability where the respective roles of the chief constable, the police authority, Scottish government ministers, and, and the wider public were actually pro pro properly discharged. We've had people in interim roles. We've had uh, we've had interim measures in place. So. To actually judge the Act, I think I would rather continue to run with the Act as it is and make sure that the structures that we have are properly implemented and properly understood. And I think I'd be in a better position to give a view then. But I don't think it's actually ever worked as, as in, in terms of the intent behind it because of various um, issues and, and, and changes that have, that have arisen. And just as a final point, um, I think it was in last week's evidence session the Scottish Police Federation alluded to overt media interest in um, the reform process, I suppose, and um, that that media interest had actually been quite detrimental to um, the organisation's development, as it were. Would you both recognise that in terms of your respective roles? Has it created barriers that might not have necessarily existed? A negative media interest in, in perhaps the, my first question, which was with regard to the tension between the two organisations? I, what, what I would say, and having again been, been part of the legacy arrangements in, in, in Edinburgh, as where I was, and then moving into the national national service, all of us collectively and, and as individuals, I think, really underestimated the amount of media and, and to be to be blunt, for that matter, political interest mm -hmm. that there would be in the internal workings of of, of Police Scotland. Now. That, that, as a result, I think has caused a lot of disorientation for, for, for everybody invo invo involved in policing. Um, but it's not a... I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily define it as, as always being negative. I think there is robust interest. And as, as I said earlier in one of, one of my answers, I think, to, to, to your questions, is that you know, we, we need to, to be in a position, and I am certainly in a position, that you know, the, the greater visibility, the greater knowledge and the greater awareness of what is actually happening not what people are speculating about, or not what people through through partiality and self-interest are leaking about, but what is actually happening in our communities and within the police service and, and, and the people that we serve. Mm -hmm. The more people find out about that, the better, because actually people can then see, for, see it for what it is, which is, is, is an, e an excellent service. Thank you. And if I could um, 
add to that, I, I said, you know, I'd cir circulated, uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd submitted to the committee a paper setting out the improvements and actions that I'd taken over the last 10 months, but I also called out some of the areas that I think we still need to make big improvements on, and this is something that um, we discussed at the last SPA board meeting, and myself and the Chief Constable have discussed this too, and, and a huge area is communication. You know, media scrutiny, parliamentary scrutiny, public scrutiny, these are all good, healthy, necessary parts of any democratic process and, and certainly of the oversight of our police service and it's part of how we ensure there's public trust and confidence in what the police service does. And I think, you know, it's incumbent both in the police authority and on Police Scotland to get an awful lot better at how we communicate so that we can, and I, and I think the SP in particular, has got a big role to play in helping to, to facilitate and foster good, informed public discourse around what is actually going on in policing now. And in fact, you see it, some of this, I think, in some of the submissions to the committee, that I think even some of the submiss submissions are referencing practices um, within Police Scotland or issues within Police Scotland to the SPA that you know, were from two or three years ago that were the very visible things, um, very often not positive visible things. Um, and I think it's absolutely incumbent on, on both organisations now individually and, and jointly to engage actively and effectively in that space so that, that, that there is informed um, coverage or, and discussion of what's going on in policing. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder, just following on from that, if I could ask uh, you, Suze Deacon, is there an issue with whose responsibility for the appointment of the SPA chair? Um, well, that's a matter for Parliament. <laughs> um, quite, quite genuinely, when I applied for, for this role um, and undertook the process as, as it was uh, carried out and I was required to engage in, which on that occasion um, also involved... Um, the former chair of the policing subcommittee sitting on the panel that, that interviewed me. It's entirely a matter for, for Parliament about how that appointment is, is, is done in the future. I have been looking at, at police governance and a lot of different systems. Um, for what it's worth, I mean, I, I think the arrangement that we have in place, I mean, I think the concern that members have expressed, and, and understandably so, you know, is whether... Um, ministerial appointments in this or any other role, some, it compromises the ability of the post holder to, to perform the role effectively um, and, and, you know, independently where we're required to do so. I, I thus far, have not find, found that um, an issue. Um, but I do know that in other systems where there's comparable organisations, you know, there's things like confirmation hearings and things like that, um, but genuinely, it's, a, it's entirely a matter for the, the, the Parliament to, to consider in the future. I think it's a matter of you know, perception. If it's the approval of the, the Scottish Minister, this then and there's a feeling that, well, there could be a feeling that um, it's, it's not as independent. It maybe could um, restrict the office holder, I appreciate fully. You haven't found that, but I, I think it's a perception. Can I ask you perhaps about the interim appointments and the secondments um, that have recently been made to SPA? Where did they come from? Um, yes, of course. I am, I, I'm very happy to, to explain that and perhaps take the opportunity to, to explain to members a little bit more about where the SPA as, as an organisation is, is at. Um, I think members may, may be surprised by this, but I think this is important to share. Um, when I took up post as chair, the Scottish Police Authority had 27 members of staff um, of an initial establishment that was set at, um, well, variously at different points, I think 50 and 60. 27 <coughs> members of staff. Now, that compares to the Crofton Commission and the Housing Regulator and Oscar all have around 50. Cairngorms National Park has around 70. Scottish Futures Trust has around 80. 27 members of staff. Now, that was not a Scottish Government decision. That was a decision by my predecessor and the then board to leave a number of posts vacant and not to build the organisation. Um, so, frankly, it's hardly surprising that um, the SPA was struggling to perform some of its, its duties effectively. By May of this year, and this addresses the, the point that you raised, convener, um, we had taken that to, to 40. And in order to do that quickly, the interim chief officer took a number of steps to, as you say, 
both second and bringing interim appointments. Um, we've, we've done that and are continuing to do that, as well as make permanent appointments that I'll just touch on in a second. But we, we've done that through, in some cases, bringing in people from Scottish Government. Um, we um, have also reached out into the parts of the public sector, um, local authorities. Um, we have an interim appointment as a Deputy Chief Executive and Chief Operating Officer just now on SCON from Highland Council. We had a member of staff from HMICS worked with us for about nine months, helping us in taking forward governance improvements. Um, and we have also gone through a process of, of drawing up a revised structure for the organisation of where we think it needs to be in steady state. And that, that would give us an organisation of around 68 people. We've made a number of permanent appointments or in the process of doing so. All those things take time and they need managed very carefully because, as, as you'll appreciate, convening, and I know members will have various experience of this, if you simply draft in lots of people into an organisation, you just create different problems. You've got to manage them into the right roles and, and manage how, how the team develops. So that's, that's a big job of work that's still in, in progress. But I hope it's helpful to set in context some of these interim appointments. I know members have, have raised questions about that before. Uh, and specifically, the secondments and the, um, the interim appointments, um, where did they come from? Well, as I say, from a range of different places. So right. some from Scottish Government. I mentioned one example from HMICS, local government. And um, we've been working with. We also have somebody from Police Scotland um, seconded to us now to um, support um, some of the development work that we're doing around looking at Im improvements to the complaints process and so on. So we've been very careful to make this a managed process of capacity and, and capability, uh, building capacity and capability. And as I say, and I really want to stress this, I see that as being the area that we really need to focus on even more in the period to come. And with a new chief executive start, starting on Monday, um, you know, I think he's very well aware that that's something that we, ex we expect a, a, a new chief executive to really build on the work that the interim chief, chief officer has done to get that organisation built effectively. But even when, I should say, even once we've done that, I, I, I would strongly support um, from time to time that process of secondment and interim arrangements, not least because it, it cross-fertilises knowledge and experience across particularly different public sector organisations. So I think it enriches the individuals. I think it enriches both organisations that are involved. Yeah, I, I suppose it's the, upper, the perception thing, and you've already answered that in that you feel that the balance is right. So I suppose it brings me to the next question in that it's been suggested there should be a separate review which sets out clear governance structures covering the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Police Scotland and the SPA. So we've heard quite clearly that um, you're working well together. There, there are improvements that have been made. But we're now in the third Chief Constable and the third SPA um, chair. So I suppose it's looking at is it personalities and if we just get the right personality or have we fundamentally now changed the governance structure so that it is right? Would a separate um, review then look at what's been put in place and help give some reassurance that was in fact the case? I think um, the, one of the worst things that could be done at this point in time is, is do yet another review of the SPA. I remember Mr Johnson asked me a similar question when I was here in January, and I said the same then. Um, as I say in my written submission to the committee, we are now working through a, a, the implementation of an improvement plan for the SPA, all set out publicly, all on the website, discussed in, in public at the board meeting, and as I say, submitted to the committee. That um, improvement review takes account of 14 separate reviews of the SPA just in the last financial year. 14 separate reviews that go into, I've forgotten the exact figure, but it's, it's well in excess of, of uh, 100, in fact, I think it may even be up to more than a couple of hundred separate recommendations. So we're working through a process of, of addressing each of these things in turn. Um, and I, I, I'm pleased that, for example, when um, her Majesty's inspect, uh, uh, Chief Inspector appeared before you and also the Auditor General, then I, I, they both commented to the fact that, that there was tangible action taking place in this, this space. Um, 
as I mentioned earlier as well, we have an entirely new governance framework that we've put in place, and that was approved by the board in June, and we made further changes to it at, at last week's board meeting. We've changed the committee structure. Um, I could go on, I'm sure you don't want me to, but the point is, it's not just mood music, you know, it's really tangible changes. Um, and you asked me, there was a, a second point there that, I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten, there was... I think I've forgotten too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, please, do, please do tell okay. me if there's something no, else. Or, or no doubt, address. we'll come back to it. Can I just say, um, the last point, um, uh, in your um, submission, you, you say you strongly caution against any legislative strange to the Act at a time and believes the focus should be on delivering further improvement, which you, you've done um, within the existing framework. But are the two mutually exclusive, uh, exclusive? Could we not be looking at some changes to legislation that would actually make the improvements that you, you want to achieve? Well, I, I think it's very important um, for all of us, and I say this re repeatedly to my board colleagues uh, as well, that we all of us remember what we're there for, and it's to make sure that the people of Scotland have a police service that is fit for purpose and fit for the future. Um, and I, I think there's been a displacement of, of energy and attention for reasons that I understand, and all the internal workings and governance and scrutiny arrangements of the, pl the police um, service and the structure that we now have, rather than a focus on policing. And I think that's absolutely got to change. The, I think one of the, 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 the greatest challenges now facing our police service in Scotland is the need for it to adapt and adapt quickly for the future. And this has been, for example, um, discussed very fully both at the SPU board and uh, with this committee in relation to um, ICT and the major programme of investment and change that needs to take place there. So I, I want to be absolutely sure, and again I go back to the statutory responsibility of the authority that I chair to maintain and improve policing, I want to be absolutely, sh absolutely sure that we are working very hard to make sure that that change is taken forward effectively in a way that's accountable, that in a way that's communicated effectively to the, the public so that they know why and, and how policing is changing. And that's why I think it's essential to, to just have stability around what that statutory framework looks like so that we, all of us, and, and you know, including that, obviously, colleagues in, in, in the Parliament, you know, can get on with the job of developing and, and delivering policing, which is obviously one of our most important public services. So, you know, I, I, forgive me, I suppose, for being, I, I suppose, really quite passionate on that point, but it, it genuinely, I think, is, is, is where the focus needs to be going forward. All right, so just to make it crystal clear, no independent review, because you're confident, regardless of who was in the position, because um, we have been personality clashes in the past, um, the, the governance arrangements that you're putting in place are robust enough to, to deal with that situation? I, I believe passionately in the need always for continuous improvement, and that's um, a mantra that I've applied to this role. So we will continue <laughs> to keep learning and building and improving the governance. But yes, we have much more robust arrangements in, in place now that I think members would recognise as being what you would expect of a public body. Um, and yes, for the reasons that I said earlier, I think having stability in the overall framework within which we work is really important going forward. And um, when I say there is no need for a review, it's because we need to act on the recommendations of the 14 that we're working through at the moment. Okay, Shona. Good morning. Uh, we've, as I think you've just uh, alluded to, Susan Deacon, there's been a, a lot of kind of looking back and so bringing us to where we are now and the confidence that you have around the SPA's ability to challenge Police Scotland uh, effectively when required and your submission, I guess in, in summary, it has really been your, your 10 months of focused on building capacity of the organisation. So just to probe that a little bit more, in practical effect, are you seeing um, because of that building of capacity and the skills that you now have around the board table, far more probing and questioning and confidence of those members, both in um, their holding Police Scotland to account, but also their questioning of the executive team. Are you visibly seeing that as a practical demonstration of that improvement? Um, I'm inclined to say, I, I suppose, it, it, I feel it's for others to 
to judge to some extent in terms of what, what, what they, they see us do, but in my opinion, yes, um, there, there has been change in that area. And I think I agree that a lot of the focus o over the last 10 months has been on building capacity, but that's, that is not, and I know it's, this isn't what you meant, it's not just in a quantitative sense, it's about the skills, skills and the capabilities yeah. and the behaviours and the culture and all these other things. Mm. Um, and yeah, it, actually more than half of the board now um, has, it, including myself, has come on in the course of the last mm. year. Um, the most recent new addition to the board actually joined two weeks ago. That was the last of the seven new members that, that we announced there earlier in the year. Um, so we've been working through a really rapid programme of change, both, as I say, in the governance framework, but also board development. So um, I pointed, a, well, I, say I recommended to the board who agreed the appointment of a, a new vice chair to the board, David Crichton. Um, so he's been focusing a lot of work on board, a lot of his time on board development. Um, so we're, you know, building exactly these kind of behaviours that you're talking about. Some of which is about questioning skills. Some of which is about, you know, understanding the the the, the environment within within which we as an authority work and within which policing operates. I think the the new members that we appointed were very job ready in that respect. That was what we we spec'd and. Um, and in that public appointments process, and that was what we got, and we got a lot of interest and a lot of really strong candidates coming forward, and I was really heartened by that. Um, so, yes, some of that is about what you see visibly in terms of how we question the Chief Constable at the SPA board in public for forum, its webcast and so on. I don't know any members ever watch any of our board proceedings, but it takes place at a lot of other levels as well, both through our committees, through one-to-one -one discussions that myself and the Chief Constable have, um, and increasingly also what we've, we've been trying to build now that we've got some stability in the leadership of both organisations is also more collective engagement with the senior leadership teams of both organisations to, um, to really, you know, thrash out what are the key issues going forward and and yes we're necessary we will push and challenge um police scotland but um do so in a way that i hope is is constructive so in terms of the next phase of what you're describing there is a, an organization that has obviously been through quite a, a difficult period uh, you've been in post for for 10 months and have brought um what you know, appears to be a, a stabilisation, a building of capacity, including the skills. So looking ahead, obviously, to the next period of time, you've got a new chief executive coming in. You, you lay out in your submission some priority areas for improvement and development, which seem to be a bit more outward looking um, than perhaps some of the internal focus that there's been. So in terms of the kind of top three priorities for the new chief executive that they're going to be tasked with, you've, you've talked about communication, but enhanced local accountability, external relationships. So, you know, if you were back here in a year's time, what would be the kind of key things that you would want to be talking about having uh, progressed, if maybe not achieved, but certainly progressed? Um, yes, a, a, a very fair challenge, and I suspect you probably will have me back here in a year's time and, and holding me to account in these things. But I, I'm, I'm very pleased that... that, that um, <coughs> that you picked up on the point about being more outward facing um, and that is absolutely the shift that I want us to make. Now I said from day one that I wanted the SPA to be a much more outward facing organisation and that's something that this parliament, HMICS and others, you know, had, had made a lot of critical comment on in the past. We've done that in t terms of changing a lot of our board practices and the likes but there's a whole capability that the organisation doesn't have and it needs to have. And it's something that this parliament and members of this committee have called out on a number of occasions, um, not least with, with reference to, for example, the, the police and subcommittee. And I've frequently heard it said in the chamber and elsewhere, members saying, you know, the police and subcommittee has had to do some of what it's done because the SPA wasn't doing its job in that space. And I think that's quite a legitimate comment. So building that capability where we can really at scale and uh, engage in and facilitate high levels of public communication, um, stakeholder engagement. We've started to do that through the main board meetings of focusing on major strategic challenges in policing. We looked at local policing um, last week. The previous board meeting was about ICT. 
Um, and one before that was around people and, and the people in the organisation. That's quite different from where the board had its focus previously. It wasn't on these big strategic developments. But absolutely, a year from now, I, I will put it on the record, I, I absolutely want to see the SP being a body that is outward facing, that it is the lens through which the public and others can view policing in Scotland. And we are, we are facilitating a good informed discussion about the future of policing. And you mentioned local accountability, and that, that's hugely important as well. I think, um, and we discussed this, as I say, at the board meeting in, in so, at some length last week, um, there has been enormous progress, I think, made in the delivery of local policing and in Police Scotland's involvement in the community planning process and police plans and so on. I think that's come through in a number of the submissions that you've received and the evidence that you've heard. Um, the, the, the thing where we still haven't um, got a good shared practice and understanding of is the relationship between the SPA and local authorities and local scrutiny committees. But one of the, the first things I did when I came into this post was met with COSLA. We've had an officer working group working all year, in fact, jointly, SPA, COSLA, Police Scotland and, and SOLAS, the Society of Local Authority, Authority Chief Executives. Um, and some of that work's now coming to, to fruition. And in fact, the COSLA's local scrutiny conveners meet next week, and I'll be attending that meeting. And um, as Councillor Whittam, that's COSLA's um, community wellbeing spokesperson, said when she appeared as part of this inquiry, that's really been the vehicle through which we've been working together to really get, get that working effectively. So it's, it's still work in progress. Um, the only thing that I would add to that about local accountability, which I know is of interest to members, is I have noticed in some of the submissions that, that there's been a couple of comments about the variation in local scrutiny arrangements, as if somehow that were a bad thing. I mean, that's actually built into the system that local authorities can and should decide in their own local scrutiny arrangements, and I think that's quite an important principle. So that's part of the challenge for the SPA to make sure that we can engage effectively with what are really quite different models in each local authority. Um, but as I say, I, I, I think that's right and proper that, that local authorities sh should identify their preferred way of, of looking at policing issues within their own structures and practices. Okay, thank you. You've actually moved on to our next line of questioning. Uh, John Finney. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, panel. Uh, if I can just carry on with that line there, and it is, uh, and uh, I mean, you've made it loud and clear, Professor Deacon, you don't want uh, any more reviews. You're not supportive of legislative change, but I don't sense that necessarily you're complacent. So to build on the comments that uh, um, Shona Robson talked about there the, uh, from, your, from your statement, um, and maybe you, you, it's too early to talk about the work that's been done with, with COSLA, but is there a potential to, to look at uh, whether the model as it is for scrutiny is absolutely the finest, or whether there's potential, some scope for the devolution of some of the work presently undertaken by the police authorities to the local scrutiny committees, however they're configured. Um, I think it's, it's, it's important for us to keep coming back to the principles of the legislation. Um, that you know, This parliament took a very conscious decision to create a single police service and a single national oversight body um, for that police service. And there was good reason for that, and we've touched on some of that today. Um, and, and I recall, um, I, it was Jill Imini, actually, when she, she gave evidence to the committee, you know, noted the point that having moved from eight different police services and police boards that, that you know, we have to be careful we don't inadvertently do things that create 32. That said, and, and you're absolutely right, Mr Finney, I'm anything but complacent. I do fundamentally think that we have to strengthen that relationship with local government. And actually, I think one of the keys to this is about communication. What we don't have just now, and what we absolutely should have, and this needs some changes at Police Scotland's end as well, although, again, to be fair, it's work, work in progress, is we should have a clear plan ahead for the year. We, there should be clear visibility about what key decisions are going to be coming up at different times. There should be active communication with local authorities and other stakeholders about when these kind of policy decisions and so on are coming up. Advance notice of major changes in policing, which may be operational matters for the Chief Constable to decide, but which rightly require levels of visibility and scrutiny at both a national and local level. And we just don't have that in place just now. So with the best will in the world, 
a local scrutiny committee in a local authority, for example, can't reach in to our work and seek to shape and influence it in anything like as effectively as they ought to be able to, in my view. And similarly, we're not reaching out sufficiently and seeking enough views and opinions in. So I suppose, in summary, what, what I'm trying to say is, again, I don't think that's about structures. I think that's about communication, culture, practice, openness. Um, you know, Scotland's not a big country in the sense, you know, we're talking about 32 local authorities, not, not 300. You know, you know, we really ought to be much, much better at, at, at having that, that relationship and that flow of communication and that, as I said in answer to Mr Robson's question as well, that absolutely is an area that I would hope a year from now we would be in a different place. In all but two of these uh, authorities, th that was joint boards. Is that a factor? Because, of course, policing was something that was, wasn't was seen as the responsibility of the entire local authority. It was seen as three or four folk from the... the, the. Is that a factor? Because, of course, you know, words like local accountability and scrutiny, we could go around the table and all have different interpretations of that. But that, that recognition that people do feel disenfranchised, albeit the legislation would suggest they've been given something, yeah, I, th I, th I think the issue of perception is really important. You know, it's often said perception is reality, and, and I tend to hold to that view. So if, whether it's a local elected member um, or, as I say, another key stakeholder, because, um, you know, there are many individuals and organisations that have very legitimate interest in what's going on in policing, if they feel that they don't have a state and they don't know what's happening, then, then we have to take that in face value and, and address it. As a matter of fact, there are far more elected members involved now in the scrutiny of policing across Scotland than was ever the case with the, the former police boards. Um, far more elected members, just quantitatively, that is a case because of these different scrutiny arrangements that local authorities have now put in place. And I read, for example, the submission of Borders Council, the Borders Council put into the committee, which I think sets out very fully and in really helpful detail about the particular model that they've developed, but that's very different from the other 31. Um, but um, as I say, it's incumbent on us, I think, to, to work with them. And I think there is a police inside, and I should let the Chief Constable speak to that. There, there is an issue as well about Police Scotland you know, getting much better as, as well at its um, local and public engagement. I know it's built capacity in that area, but um, again, it's clear, and I think we both experienced this, that you know, many of the perceptions that people have of policing um, and how it's delivered, you know, aren't actually a reflection of what's actually happening, but that's not their fault. <laughs> that means Police Scotland have to work harder at communicating too. <laughs> Here is you. And I'm aware that that's been a very, very lengthy exchange, and we've got a number of questions well, to get. Can I through. be very brief then and just add, yes, add, add another question? Yeah. And that is, maybe you can help out here, Chief Constable. Maybe you can start devolving responsibility because, of course, to get people's interest, they have something to have meaty to scrutinise, to, to, to hold the, the, the divisional commanders to accountability. What opportunities are there for you to maximise the devolution of decision making and, more importantly, resources? Please. <clears throat> Lots of issues in, in both in the earlier exchange and, 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 and in that one. Um, a couple of observations, if I, if, if I may, and I, I, will try, I will try to be brief. Um, I don't feel a lack of scrutiny as Chief Constable. I feel extremely highly and intrusively scrutinised, and, 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 and rightly so. I do think that the local authority scrutiny panels and the police authority are at the forefront of that scrutiny, but so is the Justice Committee, so are community councils. So is every, every citizen. I've just had the, the investigatory powers commissioners all over Police Scotland for, for a week, 12 individuals judicially led, looking at our ability uh, to, to, to adhere to the law and proportionality around co covert policing, a very, very important element and an a area of interest, interest to many. There are Audit Scotland has recently concluded its uh, uh, review uh, and, and, and annual uh, report. So as an organisation, I think policing is, is highly and rightly scrutinised at many, many levels and, and, and many, many tiers. In terms of the local scrutiny panels, I do think, and, and I'm 
you know, it's, it's early days, but the feedback I've had from local chief executive and local elected members is that there is a feeling now that there is much more openness and, and, and specification uh, sitting at each local scrutiny panel about what's happening within each of the 32 local areas. And a further point, if, if I may, what I've tried to encourage, you talk about local commanders, but the local commander is about is, is a key, but just one factor in the policing service being delivered in that area. So I've said, and I've said to my officers and staff, and I've shared it with, with local elected members, is that what, what we look for and what I would seek to encourage is not, it's not greater scrutiny of local policing, it's greater local scrutiny of policing. So every element that Police Scotland provides to a local community should be discussed as best we can at, at that local forum to make it quite clear that while the local commander and the local area team are at the forefront of service delivery, they're actually supported by, by a network of mechanisms and the strength that Police Scotland br brings to bear and the impact that those uh, brigaded resources and capabilities can bring uh, to, to that local area. On your second point about, um, in, in, in essence, um, increased delegation and, and autonomy, yes, that is, that is, I have publicly uh, and, and personally stated that is my intent. And, and I would like, uh, as, as best I can, and, and as we go forward, um, to devolve greater financial autonomy so that local commanders can find out with creative solutions with local partners. And again, I've already, I've already commenced that in increasing some level of, of, of financial autonomy to, to, to local commanders um, to then deploy. I've already allowed local commanders to look at their, their specific shift patterns and sh specific deployment models, because as, as, as you know, as well as anyone else, even within a local division or a local command area, it's not necessarily consistency. There are, there, there are different areas uh, in, in, in different geographic areas. So my intent is to do that because I think that will add value, but, in, but increasing that level of, of um, empowerment within, within the consistent corporate structure and framework that Police Scotland provides, that, that's what I'm seeking to do in the next number of years. Okay, thank you. Just if I could ask for brevity, we've got another two major areas to cover. We haven't quite finished this area, and um, hopefully we'll get through as much as possible. Daniel. I'd, I'd like to uh, begin by asking a supplementary before asking my, my main questions, and it, it relates directly to what has just been raised. Uh, if you look at local accountability, I think it serves two functions. First of all, is, is along the lines that uh, John Finney set out, and indeed uh, Ian Livingston just uh, explained, which is about reflecting local needs and adapting policing practice set. But I think the other one is about uh, policing by consent, that local accountability is, in a sense, a proxy by for, for policing by consent. But if you look at the, the central structure of the SPA, uh, Susan Yu is, uh, as the chair of the SPA is appointed by a minister, the SPA board is essentially then subsequently appointed. You, you are accountable to the minister, the minister is then accountable to us at parliament. The public are several steps removed. Now, I, I, I'm encouraged by what you're saying about public engagement and public dialogue. I think that's right. Do you think, though, that there is a need to, to look explicitly at, at policing by consent and where that sits within the governance function and, and actually how you can be sure that essentially policing practice, both nationally and at a local level, is actually what the, the public want and indeed therefore consent to? I'll be brief. Um, I, I think the whole concept of policing by consent runs like a thread through, or should run like a thread through all that we do. Um, and I think that focus on, on communication and accountability, including with this parliament, you know, is a, a key part of that. Um, and I think that's why, as policing changes as significantly and rapidly as it is having to do, that communication function is not just desirable, it's utterly essential. Because otherwise, that's where the public feel often maybe they're losing something, when in fact, something else is being provided in its place in order to keep them safer. But we've got a job of work to do in, in taking that, that forward. But policing by consent, absolutely. Um, is, is at the heart of the whole ethos and, and delivery of policing in this country. It must be. I, I agree with your observation. I mean, I, I was talking about le legitimacy 
and, and where we get our authority from. You know, and again, I, I say it to my officers and staff, we don't get it from an act of parliament. We, we don't, you know, we formally do. We get it from our fellow citizens. That's where the office of constable, that's where it rests in terms of the, the traditions of, of Scottish police. And so our legitimacy is, is, that's why it's so important to have that level of accountability. So I agree with you, without, without that consent, the, the, the bond between citizens and, 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 and policing uh, will not be as strong as, as, as I think they are. And I think that's why, rightly, it's so important for all of us to get that, that right level and, and right structure and system of accountability. So in terms of my main questions, I really want to ask about the sort of some of the fundamental aims of, of reform, and particularly around consistency of policing across Scotland and effectiveness. And both of you have both cited examples, both in terms of detection rates for, for murders and also um, uh, uh, policies around uh, rape and the comments from uh, rape crisis and so on. However, no integration uh, is instantaneous or effective from day one. And there have undoubtedly been shortcomings, uh, both in terms of effectiveness and, and inconsistency. I was just wondering kind of what both of you would reflect some of those may have been and what the, the lessons learned from those are. The, I, I've, I have a number of, of re re reflections. And um, I think my first observation would be that Perhaps inevitably, but that would be for others to judge. But as a, as a question of fact, in the early years of Police Scotland, and I, I was there, I was contributed to it, as, as did many, many others, we were very introspective. We, 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 we were very focused on our own internal structures, our, our divisional models, our tasking arrangements, our systems, our processes. Um, and with hindsight, you know, we, we were not and didn't, as engaged with our own staff, our own our own officers and and support staff, nor with with our own communities, nor with elected members of that community, including people who were in, on the justice committee at, at at that time. So we were quite introspective. We were not outward looking. Um, there was a sense and perhaps a, a, a reality of of imposition of change. Um, we decided what was needed and. We needed to implement it quickly. There was lots of reasons for that. We were bringing together a high-risk public service where our appetite were, for risk was very, very low. We had significant operational challenges. We were about to police the Commonwealth Games. Um, and we were bringing together a very, very diverse traditions in, in some instances of, of, of organisation. So we, we, we weren't as outward looking as, as we should have been. Um, we didn't listen. Uh, as, as well as we could have, both to our own people and, and um, to our uh, the public that, that, that we serve. Um, and as a result of that, I think there was a bit of distance created and, and there, were, there were some um, mistakes made in some of the implementation. Again, mistakes I, 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 I was party to. I think we have learned, and the two examples I would, I would give that are a foundation for a lot of our work now are, are around... Um, armed policing and armed carry. And again, members around this table were extremely critical and, and, and very robustly so about the introduction of a national change to armed policing. It had been implemented in significant parts of the country about our armed response vehicles respond, carrying open, a, a sidearm openly and responding to, 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 to jobs. But actually, that was something new for other communities, and we hadn't explained it. We hadn't explained the rationale behind it or listened to what people's perceptions would, would, would be. And, and actually, we tried to impose that centrally. The, the, the way we addressed that was actually using local trusted uh, commanders, local trusted officers to go and listen and, and, and to have a consistent national model, but applying in a specific way locally that, that people understood. And my second example, briefly, because I'm, I'm conscious of time from from the convener, is round about our, our changes to our, our control rooms and our operating model, where we moved far, far too quickly. Um, we didn't have re an, enough r robust governance around it. Uh, and, and, and again, mistakes were made. I think we learned very, very hard lessons from that. And we've made significant improvements about how we now implement change, where we do engage our local commanders, our local officers and staff, and also that we put proper governance and structures and involve external partners partners when we're making significant changes as we did with the control rooms. 
I mean, I guess if we're looking at shortcomings, it's very hard to sit here uh, this week without being mindful of the reports last week about home detention curfew. And if you look at some of the facts, I mean, there are issues there, I think, between, in terms of interagency working. But if you look at the timeline in terms of the police first being made aware in February, but not really confirming that address of the, 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 the suspect until months later, the fact that there was a number of offenders uh, recorded unlawfully at large, but that wasn't registered on the PNC. And I think the critical thing for me was the fact that you had 44 people at large, but then when actually there was acute focus on those issues, that that was able to be reduced to eight in very short order, which raises the question for me around you know, fundamental competence about the police recording the right information and acting upon it. Because that, that is, it raises a fundamental question about the, the police's ability to identify and respond to information. Indeed, I think in some ways the, the, the control centre issues, I think, centred around the same things. I was just wondering, what, what your reflections are, would be on that. I mean, is that a hangover from, from integration? Is that a hangover from the, the, the uh, multitude of information systems? Or is it more, something more fundamental um, than, than that? I, I don't think it's something fundamental. I think there were um, er errors made. There was poor communication. I think the whole system of home detention curfew had had... Um, evolved almost on, on, on an ad hoc basis. It didn't have a, a structure and a statutory basis for that. That's, that's going to be rectified. Um, there were different experiences in, in different parts of the country, and the information exchange was, was not as robust as, as it should have been. The status of a, a recall, um, again, wasn't always clear to, to officers and staff. And if anything, that's an example of the lack of consistency nationally. I accepted all the observations and recommendations that have been made by, by both inspectorate, inspectorates and, 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 and recognise that, that you know, the police service um, needs to improve its, its response to that. I mean, the thing that strikes me is, as you've already mentioned, control rooms, but on a more prosaic level, we also see issues, for example, around the lack of human rights um, assessment done on the implementation of cyber kiosks. We see uh, letters going out in your predecessor's name, which call into question the ability of, uh, of them to be enforced. And I just really, uh, I, I, I guess the, the, the question there is, to what, what degree are we, are we still dealing with, with sort of fundamental uh, issues of the, of the police service being on top of sort of fundamental issues in terms of identifying issues and acting in an, an effective manner? And, and why does it take you know, for example, in particular, uh, with home detention curfews, for there to be a, a major incident and major focus for those things to be identified and addressed. And are there, you know, is there a need to, 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 to look at that and improve the police's and indeed the SPA's ability to spot and respond to these, what are fairly fundamental issues in terms of fundamental, you, you were talking about investigating deaths, but this is about preventing them. Uh, I, I'm just wondering what your reflections would be on that. The, the there are a number of things that arise through transitional arrangements when there's a, a, ch a change of, of chief constable or the, there's a, a, um, a change of structure. So the issue you raised, I, I, again, I know it's been raised in, in, in the media um, about um, notices going out in, in a previous chief constable's name and, and authorities for that. that, that that's, that's one position that's been advanced. I don't think that's been a, de a, a determined position. Y yes, is, uh, th there will be instances where the, the police service doesn't, doesn't get everything right. Um, you know, we cannot eliminate all risk. Our duty, my duty, is to make sure that, that, that we, we minimise uh, as best we can. We are still bringing together a, whole, a, a host of legacy structures and systems. A lot of our challenges are actually to, to try to, to rectify um, the, the inherited systems and structures that, that we've had. So in regarding in information and intelligence and ICT, you know, one could have said, well, we want to create a single service, but before we do that, one of the precursors to that is to create a single structure of ICT, and then, then we'll move. The Chair alluded earlier to other jurisdictions where that approach has, has, has been taken, that they, they try to standardise and harmonise before creating a single structure. In this instance, we moved to a single structure first and then inherited the, the, the multitude of different systems and approaches that were there. And therefore, that's made, undoubtedly made, made, made the challenge harder. Um, but, 
but I recognise the challenges. I give you my commitment that, that I will be entirely open and transparent and, and, and recognise where we don't always get things right. But I do think, you know, by overwhelming margin, there's far more has, has, has been achieved by Police Scotland than, than has, has not been achieved. Could you just ask Susan to reflect on those points? In particular, you know, does the SPA ha have the ability to identify and address these sorts of shortcomings really before they end up somewhere like this? Well, this actually links to the previous question that you asked me, which was about areas, uh, priority areas for improvement going forward. And I think where an awful lot of the focus of the SPA um, needs to, to sh move into in the coming period, and again, this has been discussed openly at the SPA board, is in how different parts of, if you like, wider systems work together. As you say, you know, the, the, the example that you gave there involves different agencies working with each other. And one of the things that we discussed at some length at the board last week was the fact that now somewhere in the region of 80% of calls to the police are not connected to crime, um, but are to do with issues of mental health, vulnerable people, um, where the, 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 the police is in, uh, service is increasingly um, addressing situations where arguably other public services ought to be, um, both in terms of best use of the public pound, but critically to give people the right response and support. So I think one of the key draws for the SPA going forward, and again, one of the priorities for our, for our new chief executive, you know, is, is to, to build some of these um, strategic conversations with other partners and public service providers and other agencies and look at some of those interfaces because, you know, what the Chief Constable's spoken about there is things that, that you know, can be done, uh, his hand, if you like, within Police Scotland with our, our oversight, but actually critically getting our police service working effectively um, in the future and it is, is also all about seeing where it sits in terms of that wider system. OK, thank you. We're now moving on to Liam Kerr's question. Thank you. Good morning. I'd like to briefly focus on the complaints handling process. Uh, specifically, uh, Professor Deacon, in the SPA submission, uh, the SPA indicates there's a need to review the conduct regu regulations for senior officers. Uh, and before I explore that in, in further depth, uh, how would you do that, or how, how does the SPA see that being done to ensure confidentiality of both complainers and those complained <coughs> against? Um, yes, and uh, when we m made our submission to the committee, that predated, obviously, the announcement by the then Cabinet Secretary and the Lord Advocate to um, initiate an independent review of the whole police complaints and investigations process, and I very strongly welcomed that review. Um, and I think that um, is a really important vehicle now for looking at both the issues that you've mentioned there, but a host of other aspects of, of the way that system works, not least in relation to senior officers, um, which is the area that the SP has very specific res responsibilities. So how that is done, how that translates into changes to the regulations is a matter, I think, for, for that review to consider and ultimately for this parliament to decide. But some of the general principles that or some of the areas of improvement that I think need to be delivered is confidentiality, as you say, both around those who are complained against and those who make the complaints. I think there's an issue about um, anonymous complaints and, and you know, how they are managed. This parliament has worked through these questions itself. Uh, at various times. There's definitely an issue about the speed and the time that it takes to deal with things. And I've got some sympathy with some of the comments that Scaposa made in, in its su submission in that regard. And I think, I think this is an important point to me, that, that I think some of the language here is actually problematic in terms of, of, of public awareness and understanding and public confidence and trust. And ultimately, this system should be about ensuring that there's public confidence and trust in policing. And it has historically been the case that in policing, many things are dealt with as complaints and conduct issues, which in other walks of life and other organisations would be treated through different processes and different language be used and they'd be seen as being grievance issues, for example. Um, and my hope is, and I've, I've channeled these views in, into um, the independent review and 
the SP and our Complaints and Conduct Committee have, have been doing, doing likewise, that um, my hope would be that, that that more holistic look at the system can address, yes, the confidentiality issues, but all these other issues as well. Uh, that having been said, and you also mentioned the uh, Scottish Chief Police Officer Staff Association, uh, the, these, the, this committee has heard from them about the reputational damage uh, that can be caused to senior officers when the SPA and the Park uh, publish releases on the website about uh, on their websites about inquiries. So, going forward, will there still be occasions where the SPA provides updates? on its website about referrals to park, and if so, will that continue until the 2013 regs are changed? I, I would particularly note um, the additional written submission that the SP um, submitted to the committee after its meeting to consider complaints issues where we gave you further information on the SP practice. It is not the case that the SP routinely publishes that information. The PERC has a different practice. Um, and very often what has happened is that the SP is required to comment in response to statements that have been made um, and, and announcements that have been made on the PERC website. And when I came into office, and as members are aware, there's some very significant issues um, in, in, in this space and at that time. One of the things that I was really quite, I suppose, directive about within our organisation was that Whereas across our wider areas of work, we needed to open up and be much more transparent, this was an area where absolutely we should not be commenting. These are individuals involved, and I think it's a really fundamental aspect of any process, looking at complaints, grievances, or, you know, anything, employment situations, um, that the, the process is robust, but is, is confidential in terms of the, of the way that it's handled. So... Um, you know, I can only speak for the SPA practice, but of course, you know, there are different organisations and agencies in, involved, and that indeed is one of the things that makes it, I think, quite difficult for people to follow how, how the process works. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to ask the Chief Constable. Um, in evidence, this committee heard that investigations are not progressed uh, if officers leave the service. And of course, that can be terribly frustrating for both the complainer, but also perhaps the, uh, those complained about. Uh, so can I ask you, Chief Constable, whether the conduct regulations, the relevant conduct regulations, should be amended such that they can also apply to officers who have retired and or resigned? Hmm. I mean, I, I essentially think that is, that is a matter for um, the the public through through Parliament to, to determine because there, there are there are many interests to, to, to balance there. there there's the interests of individuals who have raised legitimate complaints and 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 the fact that they need some resolution to, to the matters that they've raised there's the interests of the individual officer uh, com complained against and and above all else there's a, there's a wide there's a wider public interest um, I think my position would be that that Whatever did apply should should apply uh, to to all officers. If if there was going to be a change, I don't think there should be a distinction based on 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 rank or or, or position. And therefore, if if one was going to make that change, um, it would pe put a police officer in quite a, a d distinct position from um, from other, uh, other other professions. I mean, I, 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 you'll be aware, Mr. Kerr, if if the allegation is of a criminal nature. Res resignation or retiral makes no difference to the investigation continues to a resolution and, and decisions are made. Um, but whether there should be a, a, either a prohibition on somebody retiring or resigning or whether the inquiry should continue, I, I, I genuinely think that's a, a, a broader question for the, probably for the Parliament to consider. Perhaps, but do you take a view as Chief Constable uh, on whether it should be uh, permissible because, uh, as I understand it, at the moment, uh, if, if an officer resigns, that, that, that's a guillotine on any process. Uh, and do you take a view on whether that's appropriate or would bear review with a view to change? I, I haven't taken a, 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 a position on that. And 
but I, but I think it's a, a legitimate question to ask. And, and, and again, with, with the forbearance of the committee, I think I would rather t take time to fully consider that. I would, I would say that there's probably a distinction that there, there may well be organisational and public interest needs for, for an inquiry to continue and actually to, to, to get outcomes from that inquiry. So, so cr crucially, that there's learning. If, if there's been a flaw in process or practice in any part of the, the system, specifically if it related to policing and Police Scotland, that we could learn from that. And that, that, that might be a distinction from any restriction on an individual officer from actually retiring or, or, or resigning. But it may be in the public interest to continue with inquiry so that the, the learning and, and feedback to complainers can be given without at the same time inhibiting an individual officer's human rights, if you like, to go and, and retire or resign in, in the interest of him or her or, and, and, and their family. So I, I, it's a legitimate point, and, and I don't have a position on it at the moment, but these are, these are just some observations. Well, thank you. I'm grateful. Professor Dee, can you do you have any view on that? Or? Well, my focus has been on, on ensuring that we Im improve and strengthen our practices and, and act in accordance with the current regulations. Um, again, as I said earlier, I think it, it is important that there be reflection on those regulations, not least in light of experience, and that's why I'm pleased that that, that review process is underway. Thank you. I've gone over time. You can allow another five minutes, Rona. Thank you. Good morning. Um, just um, following on from that theme briefly, um, Professor Deacon, I wonder if you could explain how the 2013 regulations could be amended to enable the SPA to make initial inquiries prior to referring a complaint about a senior officer to the park? Well, again, I think this is a, an area that in terms of actual changes to the regulations, I think that are best considered fully through the review. However, there are changes to practice that um, we've endeavoured to take forward within the SPA. The, the, I think what your, your question alludes to is that um, there has, under, under the current provisions and also supported by independent legal opinion that the SPA at various points in the past has, has received, there are uh, limitations on what, what the SPA can do at that initial assessment stage, which therefore creates quite a low threshold for complaints then to be referred to the PERC. Um, as our Director of Governance and Assurance set out when she appeared at the committee, um, within the SPA we've been endeavouring to be as, frankly, just as, as, as effective and, and you know, apply common sense as best we can within the powers that we have, and we've also been working with other stakeholders on looking at, at that too. So I'm deliberately not saying what changes I think need to be made in the regulations, because I think it's for others that are more um, knowledgeable about the, the system as a whole to, to make those specific suggestions. As I say, my concern is about making sure that we improve our practices and make the system operate better and more effectively within the current regulations and, and input um, some of the views and experiences and the data, actually, that, that we have as well into, into the review. Thank you. And just briefly, apologies for the slightly technical nature of these questions, but um, could you also maybe say how you think the Police, Public Order and Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2006 could be amended to clarify when the SPA can treat an allegation as a misconduct allegation? Well, again, I think it genuinely is a matter for the review and for this Parliament ultimately to, to think about what the statutory p uh, position should be. Um, I think, though, I, this links to the point that I made earlier, which is that um, there are particular definitions in the regulations at, at present, you know, around what constitutes misconduct and gross misconduct, but they're open to lots of interpretation. Um, and as I say, I think many of us as lay people, as non-police people, if you like, um, you know, we would look at some of the way that these regulations are constructed and say, you know, surely there are other and better and different ways of dealing with issues and complaints and concerns. Um, so I don't know the answer. Again, I'm glad that the question is being asked. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying really is that the, the SPA would take a kind of 
common sense look at, at that side of it and, and to see if it's proportionate in that sense, but that's not relating to changing any legislation? Well, I should, I should stress that, as, as I say, within the powers that we have, because many of these issues are matters for the PERP to consider. OK, thank you. Thank you. Due to time constraints, there have been a number of questions we haven't been able to ask, but the clerks will follow these up with the witnesses <laughs> um, to get some responses in writing. So it only remains for me to thank you both very much for appearing today. That's been a very worthwhile session. We'll suspend briefly to allow for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
I welcome our second panel today on our scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Act. Alistair Hay, Chief Officer, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and Kirsty Darwin, Chair, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service Board. I thank the witnesses for their written evidence, which we <coughs> always find so helpful, um, and invite Kirsty Darwin to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting us here today to talk to you about the benefits of reform. To be clear from the outset, the Police and Fire Reform Act is one piece of legislation, but it created two entirely distinctly separate organisations. So the remit of the Fire and Rescue Service is to save lives, protect property and render humanitarian assistance. And reform did not change that, but it did allow us to protect that role while delivering more effectively and, we believe, efficiently. Failure to reform would have meant a wholesale cuts agenda, and the benefits of reform have outweighed the challenges we have experienced during that period of change. Reform has given the people of Scotland more equitable access to the vast combined resources of the UK's largest and the world's fourth largest fire and rescue service. We take the responsibility of that very seriously indeed and understand that the public turns to us at times of their greatest need and that we have responded to every emergency call, we believe with the right resource, at the right time, in the right place. And we've been able to be there and do that despite repeated significant challenges. For example, the fire at the School of Art, Cameron House and some of the severe weather incidents that we have seen across Scotland, but for example, Storm Frank up in Ballater. The legislation has also ensured that the people we serve have had a greater say in local service delivery through our local plan consultation, our community planning partnerships where we're very active participants and robust scrutiny by our local elected representatives. The spending power that the legacy services have means that we've been able to really invest in improving firefighter and community safety, and that includes investing in equipment, facilities and training, and that has been across the geography of Scotland. Reforms also allowed us to achieve significant operational and financial efficiencies, and we've been able to take 55.3 million pounds out of our annual cost base on a recurring basis and we think that that's a significant achievement and part of the ambitions of reform. That change has been able to be delivered in partnership with our staff and with our trade unions and we recognise that this has impacted on many of the people who are delivering our services but we have tried to deliver this sensitively and want to put on record our gratitude for their outstanding contribution to what we have been able to achieve over the past five years. Indeed, successive Audit Scotland and her, his, her Majesty Inspector reports have supported these achievements and the progress, and we believe that the facts show that the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service continues to improve outcomes. The legislation gave us the foundation on which we can move forward and transform the service and do more for the people that it serves. And I therefore believe that the creation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has been good for the people of Scotland. Thank you. Rod. Yes, thank you, Convener. Good, good morning. Um, I was going to ask you if you thought that the initial um, case for reform you know, was sound, um, the financial implications, etc., and you've, you've really pretty much answered that in your opening statement, and thank you for that. So can, you, can I ask you to sort of hypothesise about what the implications might have been had um, it remained as the, as the legacy forces and that you know, the single force hadn't been created? Yep. I think inevitably we would have moved into a cuts agenda rather than an integration and reform agenda and improve agenda, in fact, for that matter. We know that we inherited a very significant capital backlog, and you may want to ask us a little more about that. And we also know that there were a number of brigades who were doing their absolute best to deliver in really quite constrained financial circumstances. We have seen no evidence to suggest that 
that situation would have changed. And we believe that the creation of the National Service has meant that we've been able to protect our frontline service delivery from potential cuts, and that in many cases we've been able to improve those outcomes, particularly around being able to access a much wider and a reliable range of specialist resources against Scotland. So we think that we've both managed to save money and we've managed to protect line front protect frontline service delivery. Okay, thank you. Mr Hay, would you like to comment? I mean, I've got no doubt at all that if we hadn't created the national service with all the economies of scale and scope that it is able to bring to bear, then we would have faced a very real cuts agenda. Um, I think it's worth remembering that um, the conveners of the previous eight authorities, they actually recognise the need faced with the financial challenges that local government were facing to reform the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, you know, clearly, what they hoped for at the time uh, was it would remain within the local government family, but certainly they saw the need to reduce the number of services to bring about these economies of scale and scope. I think it's just worth stating that there were 356 fire stations in Scotland prior to reform. There are still 356 fire stations in Scotland, and at this point we haven't changed our duty systems. Uh, faced with a reduction in our cost base of £55.3 million, um, which we've been able to um, take out of predominantly our enabling services, vitally important as they are, if we had not reformed, that, um, to my mind, would have come out of frontline service delivery, and that would have been unforgivable. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, both opening statement and response have been very positive. However, last week the Fire Brigade uh, Union challenged the assertion that the creation of a single force had been an unambiguous good for Scotland. And Unison Scotland stated that work related stress among staff is high and morale, morale is at rock bottom. Is that a picture the witnesses recognise? There is absolutely no doubt that, that change puts additional stress and challenge on our staff. We have worked incredibly hard to try to uh, limit um, the, the challenges that our staff were facing and to deal with those sensitively. But inevitably, if you're, for example, moving from eight um, control centres down to three, there are going to be some difficulties. We absolutely believe that the benefits outweigh those challenges, clearly. However, that doesn't mean that we haven't had to think very carefully about our change processes to ensure that we're offering support to those who are perhaps most faced with difficulties. We haven't had any compulsory redundancies. We have been able to retain very large numbers of our staff, and we have extremely low turnover in our staff, which we believe indicates a commitment to the service and an understanding that the service is equally committed to its employees. Okay. And Mr Hay? I think, um, as was said in the opening statement, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to staff, um, irrespective of, uh, as to whether or not they're in an operational role or in one of our enabling roles. I think their commitment to the service and their perseverance to deliver the reform agenda today has been remarkable. Um, I think there is no doubt about it that people are feeling the pressure of it. Uh, we have absolutely tried to put the right change management policies into place and do that in a supportive way. Uh, we've tried hard to listen to our staff. We've tried hard to engage and listen to our trade unions. But we have not been able to duck some of the hard decisions that had to be, that had to be made. We've had to, do, to, we've had to do those things. So I think it is, after five years, impacting on staff. I think you also have to set that into a wider context as well. Um, across the public sector, and undoubtedly in the Fire and Rescue Service, 10 years of austerity, uh, people are feeling the pressure in their pay packets each month, and have also seen significant changes to their pension schemes. When you bring all of these together cumulatively, I have no doubt at all that people are feeling pressure within the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, in, re in relation to um, the, the morale, uh, when I go out, and I do it all the time, uh, you know, at least once a week I'm out speaking to frontline staff, what they say to me is, morale's rock, rock bottom, boss. Uh, not here. 
but in the organisation. So there's an element of truth in that. Too many people are telling that. And what we need to do is we need to understand the pressures that are on staff uh, and we need to understand that wider uh, context and do what we can as an organisation. And my plea would be to your know, Scottish Government and this Parliament to recognise some of those challenges as well. Okay. Liam Kerr. Convener, I'd like to follow up on uh, that line of question, if I may. The, the FBU, we also heard uh, saying that 500 frontline whole-time firefighters and 200 retained firefighters had been lost. So my question is, do you, do you accept those numbers? And in any event, if we, if we do accept that there have been uh, some losses in, in, in staff, what impact do you feel this has had on the delivery of fire and rescue services across the country? We accept that there have been a reduction in the number of firefighters. The exact numbers, perhaps, there could be some debate either side. But we absolutely accept that, that there is a reduction. How far either side, just so the people can um, understand? I, mean, I think we've accepted that there are around about 400 whole time, somewhere in that region. Um, whole time firefighter roles have been reduced. And that, that's at every level, including many at the most senior level, because that, of course, was part of our integration agenda. What we would argue very strongly is this is not about headcount. It's not just about numbers. It's about what firefighters are doing when they're at their work. So we, we know that um, the nature of risk has changed across Scotland and that while every single fire death is an absolute catastrophe uh, for those affected and for society more widely. Actually, the number of fire deaths and the number of fires have come down massively by more than 40% in the last 10 years. And at the same time, we have had firefighter numbers reduce. At times when fires have been in their highest numbers, we've also had the largest number of firefighters. So there is not a direct correlation in headcount. It's about what we're doing. And that largely is about prioritising where firefighters are most effective, and that has to be in prevention. So we need to get our firefighters working differently and doing more of that, because we know that that's what's worked and what's made the difference in Scotland for outcomes. Because actually it's the outcomes are really important, how we use the resources that we've got to deliver better, rather than counting. So just in my, my second, the second part of that question then uh, was around, has, has there been any impact? Uh, as a function of having fewer firefighters, is it your position then that, uh, that there has been, let's say, 400, uh, give or take, uh, firefighters, whole-time firefighters reduced, but that hasn't had a negative impact on the delivery of fire services? We are clear that the number, we are on a downward trajectory for fire deaths and for fires. What's really important are being able to effectively prevent and being able to respond quickly and with the appropriate resource. And we are doing that despite the fact that our numbers of firefighters are down because we are working more effectively. We understand that working harder can put stress on members of staff, but we do believe we still have capacity to be able to do more. And that's about changing the way that we work and delivering at different times. And I'm sure Alistair will add more. But if we Can I ask about yes, the... Absolutely. I'm just conscious that uh, we're a bit tight for time. Mm -hmm. You mentioned capacity there. Uh, again, we heard from the FBU that there's almost a, a mantra from senior managers that the SFRS will always have the right resources in the right place at the right time, and they suggest that might not be accurate. Now, uh, in my own context, there were reports in... So I'm based in Aberdeen, as you know, uh, and around three or four weeks ago, there were reports that fire engines had been off the run 340 times uh, in 10 months due to staff shortages. Uh, so within that context, how do you respond to the criticism that perhaps the right resources aren't in the right place at the right we time. We have responded to every single emergency call with an appropriate response. And I would go back again, this is not about inputs. It's not about technical measures around pumps on or off the run for whatever reason. And there are many reasons for that which are not to do with staffing numbers, it's to do with repairs and, and other things. What's important is can we get the right response quickly 
to an incident, and we can do that. We're an organisation, because of our national footprint, that can breathe in and breathe out and respond as appropriate to the incidents that are required. We have demonstrated that at the School of Art. We've demonstrated it in Ballater. We can draw from resources from everywhere. So, for example, if in Dundee we need to move a resource to Aberdeen, or from Perth to Dundee. These are things that have always happened in the legacy services. There are things that we would do now to make sure that appropriate cover is there based on the risk that is at the time. Because actually these pumps don't belong to their geographical localities. They belong to the people of Scotland and they need to be moved as appropriate to reduce risk and to respond appropriately. And we believe that we are doing that. We want to focus on outcomes and protecting the frontline service delivery, not on technical counting input aspects of it. And that's what we are really focusing on. Thank you. OK, Shona. Just uh, on the subject, I, I have absolutely appreciate what you say about, about headcount, your comments on headcount, but I understood that the fire service is undergoing a recruitment campaign at the moment. Could you say a little bit more about that and how many firefighters, uh, are those frontline posts and how many you would expect to um, recruit? Absolutely. One of my great joys in the service is being able to be at graduation ceremonies, and I've been able to be at a number of them this year, and I'm looking forward to more. Alistair and I were in at Port Lethen only a few weeks ago, welcoming the new recruits there. So our anticipation is it's almost 100, 102? 105. 105 new recruits that we're welcoming into the service. Clearly, we need the right number of recruits in the right places. For lots of reasons, we did not increase our headcount for some time, partly because we weren't sure about what our future budget would be. We now have some clarity around that, we hope. So we're making sure that we recruit into the areas that we believe we need to shore up and that we can do that very specifically to make sure that the areas where we need additional resources can be better staffed. But it is really important, we believe, to focus not on absolute numbers. It's, it's easy to get tied into that, but actually on what we are doing with those individuals and how we are supporting them to work differently. It would be helpful maybe as a follow-up in writing, just in terms of the geographical locations and the, the roles, that would be helpful. Um, just to uh, follow on to, to um, another area of questioning, you no doubt aware in the last evidence session, you would have heard uh, quite a lot of discussion about the uh, issues around the, the, the SPA. And I think there's obviously a, a, a perception that, um, that the uh, SFRS and, and the board haven't really experienced some of the same tensions that, that Police Scotland and the SPA, uh, in the early days of reform anyway, uh, had in regard to their re respective roles. It'd be interesting to hear why you think that is. But also, I guess, um, there's no room for complacency here. So where would you see uh, the need to um, perhaps build capacity? Um, and you know, are you looking at governance and capacity within the board um, in terms of the plans going forward? I think it's really important to um, reiterate the point I made early on. This is one set of legislation, but it's two very different organisations, and we also have different governance structures. So from the very beginning, there were a different set of, of challenges. Um, I do believe that our board has functioned effectively, and that's been recognised by Audit Scotland. But I agree entirely that we can't afford to be complacent, and we would be looking to continue um, to improve our performance. And in fact, between the Audit Scotland reports um, on our governance, they were able to say that we had moved from a position of beginning to perform well to performing strongly. So within the last six months, we in fact have recruited six new board members to our board. We were joined by three um, in at the end of July, and a further three joined us in Peterhead at our uh, board meeting last Thursday. They were specifically recruited for the competencies and the skills that they had, and that has significantly strengthened our ability to scrutinise, particularly around finance, where we were already strong, but with the challenges going forward, we felt we particularly had to focus on that area and also on digital technologies and our ability, given the complexity of, of digital change and IT change, that we had some board capacity 
capacity in that area. So we have recruited um, specifically to shore up and support our board and its governance, but we do continue to review not only our composition through um, looking at skills audits, but also thinking about our, our governance structures and our committee structures, so that every March we have some time together as a board and the senior leadership team to look at that and to make improvements as required to further strengthen the governance so that we are prepared for all the challenges we're going to face. Okay. So, so one of the criticisms I think it was the FBU made was um, that there's insufficient knowledge uh, or experience of operational matters uh, on the board. Now, uh, I, I guess my question is, do you, uh, you know, is that a valid criticism or, or otherwise? And, you know, in terms of the skill mix on the board, is that something that you feel you, you've, if you've not got the right balance of, are you intending to um, add to those skills in that area? We believe we do have the right skills on the board and that we don't intend to add in that area. The board's role is um, recognised both for ourselves and for other bits of the public sector that what you need to be able to do is to direct strategy and to scrutinise effectively and to bring difference and challenge to the board. We have expert advice and input from our board from our four most senior officers, Alistair, our deputy, and our two um, senior uniformed senior leadership team, um, they have an excess of 120 years of firefighting experience. That is across four brigades. In fact, it would be five if you counted Alistair's time in Essex, five brigades and two continents. We have very significant expert advice, making sure that we understand the implications of all the decisions that we make. If we need additional expert view, we have the inspector. He attends our board meetings and meet with him regularly. Um, if we feel that we want additional input in any particular area, I simply pick up the phone and I speak to him. So we're very well served with expert opinion. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that um, the, the line of question I was going down has, has mainly been, been answered. but. So I won't labour it too much, but I wonder if the Chief Fire Officer um, can give any examples where uh, local services have been improved as a result of reform. I think a, a very significant example is our ability to um, provide the proper training facilities in some very remote and rural parts of Scotland. Um, there was a question earlier about the reduction in the number of, of, of firefighters, and there was a mention of 200 uh, retained firefighters. That's a fact. Uh, and it's not because that we um, don't want to recruit retained firefighters. We're actively, actively encouraging members of the community to come along and join the service. Um, but we've listened to some of the challenges that they have faced. Uh, and if you're in an island community, constantly being drawn to the mainland for your training uh, it was something that was putting people off when they had their lives, when they had their businesses or their full-time employment to do. So being able to invest significant facilities locally so that firefighters can train against the risks they are likely to face, and in those risks, it's inherently dangerous, so we need to invest in training. That's something that the antecedent services weren't able to do, and we have done. And it's, it's a very tangible example of the benefits of the national service. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, Alistair and I were out in Bimbekula and Stornoway in the Western Isles um, two or three weeks ago. We were able to see um, the new Stornoway fire station, and I was able to visit the new training facility there. We were up in Kirkwall. In fact, um, Mr MacArthur was there with us, opening the new training facility that is up in Kirkwall. We have significantly invested, particularly in remote and rural communities, because we know that they cannot draw on outside resources in the same way that mainland can. So we've made sure that at local areas where they are more remote, we've put in some of our new technologies, our rapid response units, lighter, fleeter vehicles equipped with brand new technology that can make the survivability of a fire much more likely, uh, much more quickly. So we believe that we have been able to, to do that by investing our, our resources. I think if we're thinking about local delivery, we absolutely see ourselves as a national service delivered locally. And the way that we're able to prioritise is by building strong relationships with local communities. So one of the things that I think was an an absolute genius move of the legislation was the decision to have local senior officers who are 
enshrined in legislation and who have built very strong relationships with the local authorities and with other key partners. That local plan structure that sits underneath that means that we've been able to very specifically tailor and adapt what local service delivery models and out, um, interventions might actually look like and we've been able to tailor that so that we know from the feedback that we're getting from uh, meeting with leaders and um, chief executives of councils that they think that we are contributing to their local outcome improvement plans and to better local outcomes at community level. And the only way that we know as a national service we can do that is by really good, strong, frequent engagement. And that's what we're prioritising doing. We've met with every single, either myself and Alistair or Pat before me, every single chair and chief executive of every council in Scotland. Um, we have met with four chief, and chief execs and chair uh, leaders in the last two months. We've been able to get really good feedback, for example, in Peterhead last week. Um, we were able to hear directly from a number of the local councillors who wanted to put on record the fact that they believed that the local services were actually more attuned under the national service than they had been previously, specifically because of their ability to directly influence and scrutinise local plans. And instead of six, for example, um, councillors being on a fire board, all 70 of the councillors were able to directly influence the use of resources. And for us, that's what's key. It's about what influence do they have about how resources are shared to deliver better local outcomes. So sticking on that, that, that theme about local services, you might remember about, I can't remember how long it was, an uh, earlier part of the year, um, there was a visit to Coatbridge uh, Fire Station. I accompanied the then minister, um, Annabel Ewan, and it was a f fairly positive a visit, but one of the things, and you've raised it yourself earlier, that was discussed was about, you know, perhaps some of the operational stuff like pumps being taken off and Coat Bridge and moved to Bells Hill or vice versa, and I know that's happening up and down the country. And I suppose what I was wanting to ask about, rather than you've explained the operational uh, aspect and that you can respond as a national service, but I suppose what I'm asking is how are the firefighters that are carrying that out um, kept in the loop with that and that their concerns when they're raised um, are here and there's not that, that disconnect. Do you want to say a little bit about local structures? Yep. <coughs> so, so I suppose I should start um, at a slightly higher level than the local structures where um, what we have is uh, an employee partnership forum within the organisation which is currently chaired uh, by the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, we rotate it between the uh, a board member or a, a, one of the representative bodies. So that they, they represent very directly the voice uh, of frontline firefighters or the support unions. They represent very directly the voice of staff that are actually making it happen with the new organisation. So making sure that we have these very um, formal structures in place uh, so, so that voice is actually heard, it's captured and where appropriate is acted upon. I think that is key to us. Supporting that is a very strong partnership agreement that we have with the trade unions. Again, that's the strength and the voice of frontline workers. Um, on top of that, uh, what we are currently doing at this moment in time, well, actually, we've just concluded that. Uh, we've done a staff survey. Uh, so we've asked a number of very specific questions, uh, and that's given people an opportunity to contribute, um, you know, directly to the development of the service going forward. Uh, so again, their voice will be heard there. Uh, and beyond that, what we've also got, as we've been talking about transformation and the public consultation, uh, your service, your voice, that works uh, in a number of ways. It works for the public because it is their service at the end of the day. But if you work in it, it's very much your service. So we've actively encouraged staff to get involved uh, in defining the future of the Fire and Rescue Service alongside other key stakeholders. So there's a number of very you know, um, formal uh, but structured ways to enable staff to actually have voice. It, it's key, I believe, to the success in the future. Uh, we've also got um, a whole series of um, visits. Uh, there's 356 stations in Scotland, uh, and, and I have been to almost all of them uh, over the last five years. Um, I heard uh, earlier that they said Scotland's quite a small country. No, it's not, <laughs> when you're travelling about. Uh, and it's been a real privilege. Um, you know, to get out and about and around Scotland. So as the Chief Officer, uh, I very much uh, make it uh, part of my mission to get out and listen to what staff 
uh, are saying. I go to them. I'm not asking them to come to me. Mm. It's, it's, it's one of the key things that I have to do. And I have to be honest, when I do that, many of my directors feel very uncomfortable afterwards because I'll put to them the very challenges that rightly firefighters and other staff are putting to me. So voice is key. Well, I was going to ask that point when you go out. It's absolutely encouraging to hear you get around the, the fire stations. Do you feel that the staff are open with you and, and feel that they can talk to you about any concerns they have as well as the positives that they feel is going on? I, I, I believe so. I've, okay. I've been in the fire service, you know, you know, more or less all of my adult life, you know, coming up 36 years now, started as a firefighter. Uh, I, I hope I haven't lost the ability to communicate uh, you know, with people that are doing the job that, that I joined the fire service to do. Uh, so I, I, I hope I am approachable uh, and that they feel that they can raise anything that they wish. And certainly from the range of things that are raised, I believe that they do. Would you be able to make the, the results of the staff start survey available to the committee? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much, uh, Convener. Good afternoon. Um, I, could I firstly start by suggesting that um, scrutiny by 70 as opposed to 6 doesn't necessarily lead to better scrutiny. I think as a committee that's just gone from 11 to 9, I think we're conscious that it, it is about the quality of the, the scrutiny rather than the quantity of those carrying it out. J can I also put on record um, confirmation of what you've already said about the investment in the training facilities um, in Orkney and the ability um, that allows for retained um, fire crew to get the training they need uh, in, in a way that doesn't disrupt the, the other commitments uh, that they have. But one of the um, pieces of evidence we heard last week from the FBU and from the retained uh, fire service uh, union representative was around the deployment of the rapid response vehicles, which, as you'll recall from our conversations, um, seemed to me to at least open up an opportunity for stations to remain um, on the run more of the, the time. But uh, I think I was struck by some of what I assume are uh, health and safety concerns that, that, that may be being raised by uh, union representatives. I was wondering whether you could maybe address that, but in the context of, of how you would see these sorts of uh, this sort of equipment uh, helping in, in terms of, of, of delivery of, of crucial retained stations in Orkney and other rural, rural parts of the country. Um, I think. Um, for me, as the chief, uh, there has been almost like an immersion in cold water when we created the national service. Uh, you know, to be asked to deliver all these benefits, uh, to adjust to uh, a new scrutiny regime, uh, and to deliver significant savings to the public purse it is a huge task. A huge task. But actually, what keeps me awake at night is two things. Um, it's about making sure that firefighters can remain as safe as they possibly can in an inherently dangerous environment, and also making sure that what we do uh, helps the public when they call upon us at the time of their greatest need. That's the two things that genuinely keep me awake, despite all the challenges of trying to bring about reform and maintain services. Um, so we look at these, you know, we look at these things seriously every day of the week, uh, and bringing about new technologies such as the rapid response units with uh, high pressure injection systems. The trade name is Cold Cut for the, the, the version that we've actually got. Uh, I think a number of uh, members of this committee attended a demonstration uh, recently that we, I know you attended one at Port Lethen. Uh, we built on that and we, ha we held one at Canvas Lang. We took the temperature. Uh, of a fire using the coal cut from 540 degrees down to around about 80 degrees in 30 seconds. We attacked that same fire using a traditional technique, and after two and a half minutes, we'd taken the temperature down to about 300 and odd degrees. But one of the key things is, as well as that speed of knocking the fire down, that improved weight of attack that we can bring to bear is we didn't have to commit a firefighter into the hazard zone until we brought that temperature down to 80 degrees. That's helping to keep firefighters safer, particularly at the moment. We've uh, adopted this in rural communities, uh, so we think it, it helps to keep them safer. That rapid knockdown undoubtedly is beneficial for anybody that's unfortunate enough to find themselves trapped within a fire. Uh, we can do it with less people. 
ultimately with three, and I think this is where uh, the challenge comes in terms of re uh, reducing the number of firefighters. Uh, we understand that challenge, but what this whole system is built on is ensuring that we can provide a safe system of work. Uh, and we've looked around the world, uh, not just here within the United Kingdom, where technologies like this have been deployed. You know, we've looked particularly across the Scandinavia, where it was initially um, developed, but many other places, to make sure that we provide our firefighters with a safe system of work. Time frame for that, that rollout? I mean, obviously some of the initial vehicles have, have, have already, already been delivered, but, but, but what's the yeah. time frame for yeah. that? Well, the, 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 the initial uh, batch that we brought into the service, they will all be rolled out by the end of this financial year. Uh, so that's roughly 35 new vehicles right. in rural Scotland. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And John, followed by Daniel. Yeah, thank you. Very Good afternoon, panel. I, I'd like to go back to, to, to the issue that was touched on and, and the the positive about identifying a, uh, an identifiable local senior officer to liaise, and, and if I noted you collected a few times the phrase building strong relationships was mentioned there. Now, one of the very specific policy <coughs> intentions was to strengthen the connection between uh, the fire and rescue service communities, but also elected representatives. Now, to what extent is the single service, because it's very easy, and I I'm not, don't mean this to sound glib to say, well, 32 local authorities, everyone's involved. To what extent is it measurable that there's local, more local uh, elected representatives involved than, than previously? I, I don't think there can possibly be any doubt of that, um, given that in most, and I noticed Susan Deacon mentioned earlier, um, obviously the range of scrutiny arrangements to scrutinise fire and, and police differ across different local authorities. But from the experience that, that we have had, and we have been out to visit them all and ask them about their scrutiny arrangements and to sit in in many scrutiny committees, there are a significantly larger number <coughs> excuse me, of, of local elected members involved. And I obviously gave the example from Peter Head, where there are 70 involved and not just sitting round one table at a big scrutiny committee. They were reflecting on the fact that even down at ward level, they were getting the opportunity to see the performance data and to scrutinise that and to have conversations around the community planning table. So from the multiple examples, and I've been to Borders and Fries and Galloway, I've been to Highlands, and this has only recently been to Highlands, um, we've been out to talk to the Western Isles in all of those examples, and I, I do believe that those ones are representative. A larger number of elected members are more involved, and they're reporting back to us that they believe they're doing more effective scrutiny, and they're more involved in that shared decision-making, particularly at the Community Planning Forum. Thank you. Can, can I ask, then, moving on, the, the, can you give ex perhaps examples of good practice in relation to of community involvement in the setting of local fire and rescue plans? That would be a, a real manifestation of that policy being delivered. Um, I think one of the key strengths within the legislation is it recognises that, in terms of scrutiny, one size does not fit all. Uh, and I think it, what it also does is it creates a connectivity to other pieces of legislation around community planning. Uh, so I think what we would we'd be able to demonstrate to you, uh, and we'll send a number of examples in a written form, uh, is how that ability to flex so that one size does not fit all. We meet our statutory responsibilities, but we recognise that as part of community planning, uh, and the creation of local outcome improvement plans, we can make a difference in different ways in parts of the country. So I think that the, the example would be the variety of different ways in which we assist in the delivery of good outcomes at a local level. And, and sometimes those are unexpected. So one of the things that I heard um, quite a lot about at the Borders Council was the very significant role um, of the fire service in intervening and helping women feel safer where they'd experienced domestic abuse. And that hadn't been an area I particularly expected to hear a lot about. But actually, if you think about community safety and women's feelings of safety within their own home when they've experienced violence, actually sitting around the table, police, the third sector, fire service and local authorities all sitting together to develop safety plans um, and, and working at, at those kind of contexts. And I had not imagined that that was an area that we'd be likely to be so involved with. And there are a multiplicity of examples that we hear about when we go out and around. Well, that, that's very interesting. And um, I mean, would, would that come out as part of fire prevention visits? Or 
I'm, I'm trying to, to understand the manifestation of, it, of the, the, the Fire and Rescue Service input to it that. It could be as part of health, um, home fire safety visits or safety visits, but actually that was part of their MAPA. So it, it right. was the, the, the relationships <coughs> around, particularly around community safety, around domestic violence. So it was those planning groups that we were sitting around. And I think that's one of the areas that we often get reflections on, is that whatever the councils are talking about, fire will say, well, how can we take a part in that? And it, it's entirely to do with the, the commitment and the enthusiasm of our local firefighters and their managers in saying, we think we can help with that. Um, and the widening of the role that we're hoping very much we will be able to get signed off will allow that to be even more effectively rolled out, we believe, so that we're intervening in far more areas. Because as one of my FBU colleagues said, these wider roles and these um, less traditional activities, um, we should be doing them not just because we've got some capacity, but because actually we are the right people to be able to do them, because the skills and the training that our firefighters already have can be applied usefully in so many different contexts. Yeah, I, I understand that. There's many skills. Is, uh, are you alert to issues that might be called de demarcation issues and, and treading in, in each other's toes with that? Because it's accepted firefighters have... Um, medical skills, yep. so the Scottish Ambulance Service, so do other yep. people, and we, we want any to unintended consequences, are you alert to that? We want to be a really good partner. So being a good partner means that you need a frequent communication channel. So at the very highest level, at the Reform Collaboration Group, ourselves, the police and the ambulance service meet regularly to think about integration of services, to think about co-location, to work more closely. Um, at local level on the ground, we know that we work effectively together. So part of our transformation um, consultation specifically asked for partners' views on the widening of the role and the intentions of, of where we wanted to go as an organisation. And we've had some very constructive feedback. In fact, we've almost unanimous support um, around widening the role and working more closely together and co-responding where possible. Clearly, there are some terms and conditions issues that we still need to resolve. Um, and we, would be absolutely, we will be absolutely delighted when we hopefully finally get those resolved, both because we can deliver more, but also because we can pay our firefighters more to deliver those services. Of course, resolution is perhaps more likely if the individuals are involved around the table. Are the trade unions and staff associations involved in these discussions? It's not something that's subsequently presented as... They are absolutely involved. And in fact, you may have heard Chris McGlone, um, I believe he's here today too, talking about widening the role and agreeing that in Scotland we think that's the right thing to do. Sitting at the National Joint Council for the UK, there is broad agreement um, that widening into further roles, into new work streams, is absolutely the thing to do. It's the right thing to do for communities and for firefighters. The only thing that's holding back is getting the money settled. Um, and we are optimistic that in due course we can do that. And that will allow us to deliver even more within the current confines of the legislation. And this may be sympathetic, and that, that would entirely square with the legislation that we're scrutinising, that it, it, it would facilitate that, there's no inhibitors that would mean you couldn't broaden these roles? Absolutely not. The legislation is facilitating, and we could do all of that work within the current legislation. OK, thank you very much indeed. Daniel. Um, I'd like to just begin by direct, uh, following directly on. You, 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 you quoted Chris McGlone uh, in your previous response there. You also said uh, that there wasn't sufficient uh, time uh, for training, and that was also reflected in the comments from his colleague who was representing uh, retained firefighters. Are, are they wrong? Can I off with, with that, and Alistair may want to add in, as Chris iterated, our firefighters have 300 hours of training per year. Now, while I think we would all argue that we want more time for training, that is an enviable amount of time for people to be able to receive training. The RDS issue, the retained duty um, service issue, is a slightly different one, so if we park that slightly. But much of the wider role that we want to, and I will come back to it, I'm not putting it to the side, but within whole time, many of the, the additional roles that we want to expand into, our firefighters already have those skills, at a road traffic incident, we are already doing medical interventions. We, we respond as we need to, and many of those skills currently exist. So we do believe that that training 
time is enough. Clearly, if we're going to be expanding into new roles, we want to um, be able to make sure that it's as appropriate as possible. And we're currently doing a training review so that we can make sure that we're training specifically what is needed and not, for example, repeating training unnecessarily. Um, if it's um, retained duty service training, I think we've got larger issues with the retained um, duty service other than just training issues. Um, and that's a challenge that has been a difficulty, as our retained colleague said, for probably more than 20 years and, and, um, and is a problem across the UK and across the rest of Europe. For that reason, we have specifically referred um, our concerns about the long-term sustainability of the retained duty service to the National Joint Council, because the, and that's a UK-wide body, because there are national terms and conditions around that. Um, that actually make that quite difficult to resolve locally. So I'm slightly confused because last week we heard that the training that time that they receive is, is necessary for the, the, their current scope of roles and that they would need additional training time for the additional scope. Are you saying that either that there, there is a surplus in training time and so therefore that it can be accommodated or that there's no additional training required? Because I, Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just not quite yep. sure how your comments square with yep. what we heard last week from the representatives. Well, I think there are factors. issues of judgment, aren't there? And I think as a panel, you would need to make a judgment about whether 300 hours, several days of training each month was enough for the roles that we, uh, that we undertake. What we're not saying is we're going to keep doing the same training and add other things on. Much of the training we're doing is highly relevant. But equally, we are doing a training review so that we can make sure that the training we deliver best suits the new roles going forward. As Alistair has said, the health and safety and this, the appropriateness of the training of our firefighters is absolutely key, and we need to get that right. So what training are you proposing to cut in order to make time for uh, the additional roles? It, it's, it's not about cutting. Um, well, you, you're, you're saying that you'll have to stop You'll, cut, you'll, you'll, you'll reduce the amount of training. It's uh, about doing it differently. And so that you can, can, give you some can practical create time examples. for the, the new roles. I mean, that, that, that's the implication of what you, you said. It's about doing things differently. So again, it's not about adding things on or taking things away. It's about more effective and more efficient in the training that we're doing, making it more tailored and ensuring that what we're delivering in training is exactly what our five features need. And that's why we are doing the review. Alistair. Yeah, if I can come in there, can I just restate... Um, up to 300 hours training a year for a whole-time firefighter, that, that, that shows the, 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 the real priority we place on training as part of creating a safe system of work to ensure our firefighters are safe at uh, the inherently dangerous environments we ask them to operate in. That's what a whole-time firefighter does. Um, again, many, many of the uh, expanded role tasks that we're going to ask people to do we are already training people to do that. So the focus is often on um, emergency medical response, and specifically out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. All firefighters are trained to perform that all, already. So much of it, as Kirsty said, is extremely relevant already. However, things that I trained on as a firefighter 30-odd um, years ago are not the things that firefighters train on now because the risks, the technology, the tasks that we are asking people to perform change. So as we expand and change our role, what we would do is look at the syllabus and make sure that we still give them uh, you know, a, a massive amount of training, because it's extremely important, but we would focus on the skill areas that they require to do the jobs that we are asking them to do today. I see it as part of a natural evolution in the same way that you know, what I trained on 30 odd years ago is different. Can I touch on the retained? I, I yeah. can see uh, you're, you're desperate to come uh, uh, back in there. Um, but if you'll allow me, I'll just touch on the retained. A retained firefighter, uh, they do between two to three hours a week, and we ask them to take on many, many uh, of the tasks and the jobs that we ask a whole time firefighter to do. We have what is called national occupational standards in the fire service. So we have 46 different modules, uh, and you get an SVQ level three. 
um, that tells you that you are safe to operate within the community, so vocational qualification. A retained firefighter gets that for covering 19 modules over three years, a whole time firefighter, 46. I think what that demonstrates to you that is, is that there is a flex in there, and it's about training firefighters within those national occupational standards to do the tasks that we expect them to turn out and do on a daily basis for their communities. So, I mean, just by way of clarification, I'm not trying to be tricky, but, but just in terms of the, you have 300 hours, and either these additional roles require new training, which you're not currently delivering, or they or they don't, and therefore that either needs to be incorporated within the 300 hours or not. That was all I was really just trying to establish. And there just seems to be a little bit of a, yeah. a difference of opinion between well, the, 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 the people representing uh, firefighters and, yeah. and yourselves on that point. And it's just, and that might not be bottoming out now, but it would certainly be useful to understand yeah. in the fullness but of time as, I, as those plans mature. Yeah, I think that the Fire Brigade Union and ourselves are frantically arguing to agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, we do not and will never um, compromise firefighter safety by not giving them sufficient uh, training for the tasks that we ask them to take on. And equally, we don't want to com compromise public safety because if they're not properly trained to carry out a task, how are they going to keep the public safe? So there will need to be, as we've pointed out, a, re you know, a fundamental review of those 300 hours and how we use them to best effect. Can I just briefly ask you my, my main question, because I've been slightly uh, diverted. I mean, one of the fundamental aims and stated aims of integration was about uh, the, bringing the ability to deploy specialist resource um, more consistently throughout Scotland. Could you maybe just give some examples of the type of specialist provision and, and also how do you ensure that that is actually consistently available? Because there's clearly a, a tension between specialisation and, and, and availability, uh, you know, especially when you're looking at the fire service and, and indeed the, the, a country, the geographic uh, size of, of Scotland. A very obvious example uh, is in relation to water rescue. You know, clearly, this is Scotland. There's water everywhere. I've noticed. Uh, yeah. um, I, and increasing the number of water rescue ass assets is, is an important thing for helping communities. What, you know, water is a great asset for us in terms of um, our lifestyles and, and, and you know, particularly around leisure. Uh, it's a magnet for people, isn't it? Uh, so we, we need, well, one of the things that we have done is we've increased from 14 to 20 the number of specialist water rescue assets, a far better um, distribution around the country. Um, but I think one of the other issues is uh, that we are an intelligence-led organisation far more than we were previously. Uh, so, yes, there is that challenge. How can you have the right resources in the right place at the right time? And, and you can't have everything everywhere all of the time. So if I give you an example from Storm Frank, you know, we work very closely uh, with other agencies, SEPA and the Met Office. Uh, so we are aware of when and where uh, a storm is likely to impact the most on communities. And what we can do is we can forward deploy these specialist assets from other parts of the country so that when the worst actually happens, we are already set up within that locality to deal with the instance. So having more resources is part of it, but also deploying them in a different way, in an intelligence-led way, and having the logistical support behind that to make sure that it is effective. Can I just briefly, is there a sort of specialist, generalist tension? Is that something you sort of keep a, a, a watch on, or does, or is there a very sort of clear view of kind of core skills that every firefighter has yeah. to have? Um, at, at the moment, uh, there are core skills that every firefighter um, has to have, um, but if they are doing things that are beyond the role, then they, they attract additional payments for that, and within those 300 hours, 220 roughly are core and 80 are for specialisms. That's the way that we divide it at this moment in time. But there is a very real discussion and debate about how many skills can an individual have. My personal view is that you know there is a limit to that. Uh, but what we need to look at is the team. Uh, so does the team collectively have the skills to be able to deal uh, with all the huge variety of incidents that we are likely to get? Uh, deployed to as a fire and rescue service. So team typing is a concept uh, that we have a, a limited amount of within the service, but I would see us increasing that going forward. 
Can I thank the witnesses very much? That concludes our questions, and um, I think that's been a very good session with very <coughs> detailed answers to our questions. Uh, we're going to move straight on now to agenda item three, which is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under uh, the Act in relation to the following UK statutory instrument proposal, the Criminal Justice Arrangements for Compensation Revocation EU Exit Regulation 2019, and this is under the European Withdrawal Act 2018. I refer members to Paper 3, which is a note by the clerk, and invite any views, questions or comments from members. Do members have any views? No. That being the case, is the committee content to recommend that the Scottish Parliament gives its consent to the UK Parliament <coughs> to pass this statutory instrument? Yes. yes. And uh, are members agreed if the clerks and I um, uh, produce a published, uh, that, that the clerks and I produce a published uh, produce and publish a short factual report. <laughs> Got that out eventually. Agreed? <laughs> Thank you. Agenda item four is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of 25th of October. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for comments or questions. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide this feedback. Uh, <coughs> Thank you, Kavina. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the, we, at that meeting on the 25th, we uh, agreed our uh, draft report on the pre-budget scrutiny. And we also considered our, our work programme and uh, agreed that at some future date, particularly given today's um, scrutiny, that we would invite the Chief Constable and the Chair of the Police Authority to give evidence. Um, we also uh, request a written update from Police Scotland and the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, a uh, review of the justice services that they can provide to migrant communities. And leading on from that, it's our intention to take evidence at a future meeting on Police Scotland's role in the immigration process. Uh, we also have uh, agreed to write to Police Scotland, the Human, Scottish Human Rights Commission and the UK Information Office on Police Scotland's proposed rollout of the use of digital uh, device triage systems, often referred to as cyber kiosks, and there's a number of issues around that. And importantly, we agreed to continue to monitor the implementation of Police Scotland's digital data in ICT um, strategy and policing 2026 uh, and the significant sums of money that are concerned with that proposal. Do members have any questions mm. or comments? No. That being the case, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on the 6th of November, when we will continue with our post-legislative scrutiny of the, fire, uh, of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. We now move into private session.